My name is Ann Kringle. I teach here at the law school also. Um, and Regina uh, invited me to moderate this panel because she knows that I also have an interest in storytelling. Uh, I direct the legal writing program. I also teach a law and literature seminar. And in both contexts, I'm always telling the students that lawyers are storytellers. And so you certainly saw that this morning, that lawyers are storytellers. In those panelists are having to tell their stories uh, within a very structured environment, within uh, legal proceedings, strictly legal proceedings. Um, and yet, they still are really uh, telling stories. These panelists are in less structured environments, um, still in law-related uh, subjects. But um, as you'll see, there's a little bit more freedom. Um, and the kinds of stories they're telling are closer to what we think of it as films um, and are films. Um, the first panelists are uh, the Kunstler sisters, as Regina refers to them. Um, uh, Emily received her BFA uh, in film and video from NYU's Tisch School of Art in 2000. She worked as a video producer for Democracy Now!, an independent national television and radio news program, um, and did some other film work. Uh, and she was a studio art fellow at the Whitney in 2004 at the Whitney Museum in New York. Sarah received her BA from Yale in 1998 in photography and her JD from Columbia in 2004. Together, they founded Off Center Media, which is a documentary film company, production company. Um, after their success in 1999 with a film that they made called Tula, Texas, Scenes from the Drug War, the impact of that film, and I'm guessing they're, they're going to talk about it, um, inspired them to dedicate themselves to using media to expose injustice. So their company produces low-cost videos for nonprofits, uh, new releases, and they're currently making one about their famous father, William Kunstler, um, sentencing and clemency videos, public service announcements, documentaries. Todd Wolfson is finishing his PhD in anthropology at Penn. He focuses on the role that new information technologies can play in social movement building, and he's been doing a lot of different work on a local level and a grassroots level to use media for, uh, for social, social justice campaigns. He's a co-founder of the Media Mobilizing Project in Philadelphia, which tries to use technology in organizing campaigns to highlight the issues and strategies that, and make connections among groups that he works with. He also develops digital newscasts for immigrant communities. Um, he started a blog on issues of housing and equitable development. He's developing public service announcements for grassroots campaigns. Um, and he also, I thought this was very interesting, videos meetings between community uh, organizers and uh, people in authority, I assume mostly office holders, in order to document those interactions and hold people responsible for what they say in those interactions. Um, and then uh, I'll just quickly introduce uh, the, the third panelist, or the fourth panelist we were going to have, um, uh, was Scott Braden, um, who in 2001 uh, made a, is a, he's a federal public defender in Oklahoma. He made a clemency video for Jack Dale Walker, who was uh, set to be executed and was in fact uh, executed. Um, and he was to talk about the clemency video that he made for Mr. Walker. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit and uh, uh, read some of the answers to questions that he sent us uh, when, after the other panelists have spoken. So with that, uh, Emily and Sarah. Um, hello, I'm Sarah Kunstler. This is Emily Kunstler. Um, uh, this is Todd Wilson. <laughs> um, when, uh, over, over the lunch break, Emily and I were talking about the ways in which um, this piece of the panel or our presentation and our work is different from what you heard earlier. Um, you know, part of it is that uh, 
although I, I am a, an attorney, I'm, I'm here as, as a filmmaker, so we're, we're, we're filmmakers. I have my filmmaker hat on. We're filmmakers, not lawyers. Um, another piece that's different is that most of the work we do is for defendants, not plaintiffs. We work in the criminal justice context and make films for people who, um, for one reason or another, find themselves being prosecuted. Um, as Anne mentioned, we started our company in 1999 um, after we went down to Tulia, Texas. Uh, the reason we went down there was um, our mother founded a organization called the William Moses Kunstler Fund for Racial Justice in our father's memory, which investigates and exposes racial injustice across the United States. And we received a letter um, from a local reverend in the town of Tulia who asked us to come investigate what was happening there. And uh, we didn't go to Tulia with the plan of making a documentary or making an advocacy video. Essentially what happened um, was uh, we got there for the, for the, the final of 13 trials. Um, the, the, I don't know how many of you are familiar about Tulia or the, or the drug was staying there, but essentially um, 46 people were, uh, were 46 African American people in a town of 5,000 people were prosecuted for selling uh, cocaine to an undercover officer. They represented over 10% of the African American population of the town, and um, they were, um, it, it turned out to have been a, a, a very illegal uh, drug sting. Uh, where everybody had been wrongfully convicted and wrongfully sentenced. And um, what we saw when we got there was so shocking to us that we realized that the best way to, uh, to convey that, to bring it home to our community and, and to, to spark dialogue about it was to make a video about it. I'm going out in Texas, black woman. Uh -huh. To hear that while I'm on. from 1920 and now is they can't take us out and hang us on a tree. They can just send us to prison for life. It's the same thing. We ain't gonna never be free again. We all gonna die. In the spring of 1998, Sheriff Larry Stewart decided to investigate the drug scene in Tulia, a small town in the Texas Panhandle. Using funds from a regional drug task force, the sheriff hired an undercover agent named Tom Coleman to conduct a covert sting operation. Early on the morning of July 23, 1999, the arrests finally came. Even Sheriff Stewart was unprepared for his agent's success. In 18 months, Coleman had allegedly made more than 100 controlled buys of powdered cocaine. As the images of the suspects appeared on the evening news, it was clear that those caught in the sting had something in common. Forty of the 46 arrested came from Tulia's tiny black community, which numbers less than 350. More than 10% of the town's black population had been taken down on the word of one man. The only evidence we had to go by in the trial was the uh, officer who had uh, been there to receive the drugs, to buy the drugs, and uh, we trusted that the officer was telling the truth. 
Joe Moore, the first defendant tried, was described by District Attorney Terry McEachern as one of Tulia's major drug dealers. At 57 years old, Joe Moore, a hog farmer, was the oldest defendant. He was sentenced to 90 years for two counts of cocaine delivery. They say we had AK-47, AK-47, them big gone. They say we had new car, uh, gold chain, new sports wheel. Ain't none of them kids in town that even had a car. I'm the only one who had an old raggedy car, or oh, that was an old 1985 Oldsmobile. Gary Gardner, a local farmer, has known Joe Moore for over 25 years and has frequently employed Mr. Moore to work on his farm. This house here is where Joe Moore lived. He's the man Mr. McKeachin called the kingpin of the two you drug dealers. He was made out to be the horriblest, baddest person, you know, in the world. The kingpin, the top, top man of whatever. He never owned any expensive vehicles, any expensive toys, or any expensive house. If he ever made any money dealing dope, he still got it, because he damn sure didn't spend it. While surprise search warrants were served at dawn on the alleged dealers, not one of the raids turned up drugs, weapons, or significant amounts of cash. We went, you know, we went down there and you see there's just a host of, of amazing characters, um, and we heard their stories. And you know, we could come home and we could tell people what we heard, but it would never have been as powerful as actually bringing the voices of these people back themselves. Um, so we went back again, and this time with a video camera. And it's hard to watch this today because we made this movie almost 10 years ago. Um, and we've learned a lot about, about filmmaking since then. Um, so it's hard to watch it now without cringing. But it was the success of this film um, in helping um, initially uh, get a new get new legal defense for, um, for all the people that were serving time and all the people that had taken pleas. Um, and then they opened up a, a federal investigation into the sting, um, and also to, to try to, to send it to media outlets to generate um, people to write articles to help frame the story. Bob Herbert picked it up, and he wrote a series of f five articles on Julia. He wrote a whole series that got a lot of attention, um, and eventually it ended up being sort of a media circus. Everyone got really interested in it. I mean, it was such an extreme story. I mean, it, it isn't in a lot of ways. A lot of it's very similar to a lot of what goes on. Um, and we, we hope to have that come across in the video as well. Um, and it also was used in, in helping pass several bills um, in, the, in the Texas legislature and um, ultimately helped with the elimination of the Texas Regional Narcotics Task Force, um, who was responsible for, um, for orchestrating the sting. Um, <coughs> And eventually, it led to the exoneration of all 46 people um, in 2000. When were they exonerated? Yeah, August of 2004. Mm -hmm. um, so it was it was seeing how you know if you if you put the story together and if you send it out, people are a lot more likely to pay attention and write a story about it. You know, all of these news agencies have have very limited resources, um, and if you send out a fully packaged story, they're a lot more likely. Um, to write about it, you know, and our biggest compliment is when our interviews are quoted as the interviews of the reporters themselves, and and you know, and they're released to a large audience that we could never reach. Um, so, so it was, you know, it was, so it was that it was this movie, but the process of making this movie, seeing the effect that it had, it had, you know, in the early, um, in early two thousand, and then also a lot of lawyers and and organizations were realizing how cheap and easy it was to control their own media. Um, so they started gaining interest in it. So it was just sort of this perfect moment to begin doing this work for us. Um, is there anything else you want to say about Julia? Um, I, mean, I, I guess we, I think it's important to understand that we didn't know what we were doing when we made this. And I don't think you, I don't think you have to be afraid about not knowing what you're doing um, in, in just taking a chance if um, you're doing um, advocacy and it's a compelling story, it needs to get out there, you just can't be afraid to turn on a video camera and start making a document of it. Um, now as compared to 10 years ago, is it's actually just get, gotten easier and easier to disseminate this kind of work. When we were, when we made this and uh, we were dubbing VHS copies of it, 
and you know we didn't we weren't we didn't have a mass DVD duplicator. We were dubbing VHS copies of it and essentially handing it out in the back of our car. You couldn't see it on the internet, um, but even even without those kinds of you know digital tools that we have today, when you have a good story um, and and told in a compelling way, it'll get out there. Um, one of the most uh, you know, th this was not virally sent out into the into the internet, and it didn't reach thousands of people that way. But it did reach thousands of people just who were handed videotapes. Um, one of the the ways we, when it finally dawned on us how far this video had gotten from our hands in the back of our car, was um, several years after we made it. We were at in Tulia, Texas. Um, at a at a demonstration, what was that called? It was the Dirty for Justice. That was the we could never again rally. Oh, that was good. They, the the community had had organized um, to to fight racism, um, and they had this you know they they you know in, with the acknowledgement of what had happened to them, they wanted to they wanted to have some sort of you know substantial change in their community in the way that they were treated by law enforcement and the way that their community received funding for you know for their law enforcement. So they had this rally that was. Um, and they're very small, you know, the, the, the African American community truly is very small and it took a lot of courage for, for them to, to take this public stance. Um, so it wasn't an easy thing to do, but they had a never again rally where they reminded people about, um, about what had happened to them um, and demanded not only justice for that, but that, you know, that their, their children be protected from, from future um, racism in, in, through the the criminal justice system and through the law enforcement and local community. I thought she was going to take away the end of my story. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but she was just setting it up and explaining it better. Um, so what, what happened at that rally was we were we went there and we brought about 100 or 200 that we were handing out from the back of our car. And we ran into a couple, couple of people who were handing out their own bootlegs from, from the trunks of their cars. <laughs> and that, that was when we knew it had got, it gotten out there. And that we, we, it, we, it, we came to learn that most of the people, I mean, it was a rally organized by the local community, but, but thousands of people came to it from around Texas and, and maybe even further than that. And, and what had been the impetus to bring people there was watching the video. Um, so I guess another thing that we learned about advocacy work through the process of making this video is that there is no real finished product. You know, the story continues to develop, and as the story developed, we continued to update our film. Um, to, you know, to, so we would tell the full story and it wouldn't be an out of date, you know, useless um, piece of media. So, um, and actually it's, you know, the story is so compelling to us that we're still, we've never stopped shooting and we're still in the process of completing a final version now almost 10 years later. Uh, so, oh, so this film was not, the, the, the impetus of this film was not uh, a legal team or a law firm or, um, you know, it, it was, I guess it was activist and filmmaker initiative, initiated, but it, it could have been. Um, I mean, it, it, it was produced at a point where there, where there were no lawyers, but it could have just as easily have been produced by a legal team um, to bring attention to the case. And in fact, once, um, what happened was this, the film was shown to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and after watching it, they decided to, that they wanted to coordinate the defense for the, the people who were still in prison. And then they used the film to, as a recruitment tool for corporate law firms that they brought on board. And then they actually commissioned uh, a later version of the film um, that, that highlighted more of their involvement in the story <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that they used um, for, for self-promotion, for promotion of, of uh, you know, for, for advocacy work, um, and to show their funders what kind of work the kinds of work that they were doing. But just a small artistic compromise we had to make in order to get, you know, the story further. Um, I guess we can talk about some other projects. Oh, we have no idea how much that cost to make, because most of it was sweat. Um, you know, we just kind of made it as we went along. Eventually, I think, uh, for the second version of it, the, um, the LDF gave us something like $15,000, ten to $15,000 to to make an updated version. Um, the, the next project we want to share with you is called uh, Pattern of Exclusion, The Trial of Thomas Millerell. Um, and 
essentially this was our, our, the next project we made after making the Tulia film. And the way we got involved with, with uh, this case is uh, when I was in my first year of law school, I had a telephone interview with the Texas Defender Service um, and with uh, Jim Marcus, who was the, the director of the Texas Defender Service at that time. And in the, it was an interview for summer internship, which you know you law students will be familiar with, and you lawyers maybe you remember. Um, and during the course of the conversation, we discussed Julia, and, and he was like, well, you know, I have a client who's going to be executed in... Uh, six weeks and uh, who has an execution date in six weeks and we have a, a we're trying to get his case heard before the Supreme Court and uh, can you make a video um, and you know I, I was younger then and, 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 and you know probably would say yes to more things then than I would say now but we said yes and I think the Texas Defender Service had um, ten thousand dollars and we said oh of course we'll do it for ten thousand dollars you know and which, in retrospect, is you know, is, is uh, you know, probably just covered our, our expenses in, in putting the project together. But um, this is a, a, a film about um, racial bias in jury selection. Uh, Thomas Millerell had a, a, a Batson claim that um, that African American jurors were were struck from his jury without cause. Um, or yeah, right. And uh, that peremptory challenges were used inappropriately. And at the time it was made, Thomas had spent 17 years on death row, and it was kind of, it was a really intense time to make this film because we we felt this this time pressure of his impending execution. Uh, and I guess we'll show five minutes of it before we talk about it more. A jury is being chosen for a criminal trial. Each side is allowed to challenge the qualifications of any juror if they cannot follow the law. And that's called a challenge for cause. And you can do that as many times as you come across a juror who's, who is not capable of following the law. But in addition to removing jurors who cannot, or potential jurors who cannot follow the law, each side is given a limited number of what are called peremptory challenges or peremptory strikes. And those you can exercise on any basis at all. The only limitation on a peremptory strike is they cannot be exercised on the basis of race. It's so clear in this case what happened. And if we fail to correct it, if the courts fail to correct it, it sends a message that it, you, know, you can get away with it and that you know, a little bit of racial discrimination is, is OK. My name is Dorothy Millerell. Uh, I'm the wife of Thomas Joe Millerell. Thomas has an execution date for February 21st, 2002. I never knew that the laws of the land could be so corrupt and so unfair until I myself was caught up in the system. My name is Carol Bogus, and I'm a housewife, first of all, and a mother of three sons. All right, my name is Wayman Kennedy, and uh, so I live in Dallas, Texas. My name is Billy Fields. I'm a resident of Dallas, Texas for the last 35, 40 years. And I've been residing in Dallas, Texas all of my life. I've been employed with IBM for 24 years. In the fall of 67, I became a postal employee. And, and I'm an occupational therapist. I spent three years in the Army. I have been a Sunday school teacher. I'm a deacon. I work with children in the community, doing Boy Scouts as a den mother. We do outreach work there. We have uh, seminars that we teach people about the Bible and God and their personal responsibility to Him. I think it was 1986. 
I was summoned for jury duty. I was called basically almost once a year. I was um, told at that time that I had been chosen to serve on a panel for a criminal case. The only cases I've ever sat on were uh, civil cases. I was eager and willing to serve and be an impartial juror. There's no reason why I couldn't be fair. I feel I could have been a fair juror because um, I feel that I could render a fair opinion by listening to the evidence. I'm concerned about crime in my community and just particularly my neighborhood community right now. If one is guilty of an offense, then he has to pay the penalty set forth by the statutes enforced within a state. If someone commits a crime, then they should pay the consequences. Yes, I would be able to render the uh, death penalty. Yeah, I could vote for the, the death penalty, yes. If I had felt that beyond a shadow of a doubt he was guilty and indeed deserved the death penalty, then I could have given him that sentence. Yes, I was surprised to find that the prosecution was the one that struck me because I, was, I, you know, I would have thought it would have been the other way around, yes. It was a surprise because I was expected to be possibly uh, rejected by the defense because of some of the questions that had been asked. And as a matter of fact, after everything was over, the judge called me up and commented that he was surprised that the prosecution had stricken me himself. What to look for in a juror? You are not looking for any member of a minority group. Which may subject them to oppression. They almost always empathize with the accused. I don't like women jurors because I can't trust them. That's bogus. Well, I think that this probably needs to be trashed. You as a black and African American, you can't render uh, a right decision. White Protestant Americans are the ones that have the right to <clears throat> serve in this country and even live in this country. It really upsets me that they think like that, that they think that uh, they can't trust me, not even knowing who I am. It's not right to, for the justice system to be biased like this, but uh, it's no surprise. As you're watching that, I was thinking there's so many things that I could talk to you about about this film, but I don't think we have time to talk about all of them. Um, the, I guess that uh, you know, the, the main thing about it is that it's kind of a hybrid. It's, it's, it's somewhat of a clemency video um, in that um, it was, there's parts of this, a little bit that you did see and more of it that you don't see um, about humanizing Thomas Miller-El and making, trying, with the eye on making the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles look at him as a person um, and, and somebody who, you know, who should not be killed. Um, the, the other piece of it is that it's, it's about um, a legal issue, and it's about a legal issue that at the time the film was being prepared was the Supreme Court was deciding whether or not they were interested in hearing. Um, so, um, you know, what, what Thomas doesn't have, um, or which he arguably doesn't have, and which is not represented in this, in this film at all, is innocence claims. Later on in the film, you do see Thomas. We did get access to Texas Death Row to film him, um, which I know is, is probably a, something that many of you are interested in. You know, how do you get that kind of access? Um, in, in our experience, it's been, it, it depends on the state. It depends on the, who the public affairs officer is for a particular prison or prison system. Um, I, I, there are some cases in which it's possible to get a court order to get that kind of access. Um, I think that's probably more common in situations where the, the footage of shooting is going to be used in a legal proceeding. In this case, um, that's not how it was done. Um, Texas actually, uh, although you know, there's many uh, evil things about Texas, one of the good things about Texas is they actually do have a pretty liberal policy of allowing media um, and non-media into, into the facilities to make, um, particularly around uh, people on death row, to make videos and to interview people. Um, 
we've actually, as we've continued to do this work and do this work in Texas, they know who we are in Texas now, and it's actually becoming harder and harder for us um, to get access to Texas death row. I don't know at this point whether we would be allowed access to make another video without a court order. Um, which is a shame, um, and it's something that I think the legal and video community needs to figure out how to how to deal with. Um, the the last time we were denied, um, which I think was about six months ago, um, the, they didn't give a reason. They don't have to give a reason, um, which is unfortunate. But but what we had heard um, from people who had spoken to the higher ups, we had been admitted, and then last minute we were denied. It was because of someone who remembered this film and the impact that it had. And Sarah will tell you about the impact. Um, you know, one of the things that the, the, the panelists were discussing in the morning program was whether or not to include a plaintiff in a film. I guess our issue is whether or not to include a defendant in a film. And you know, we, we made this a number of years ago. I don't think that, you didn't see Thomas in this film, but I don't think that Thomas is the most effective piece of this film. And the story may have been more effectively told without him. Um, in many of the films we make, particularly the more recent ones, we've had to do them with the challenge of being denied that access completely and how to tell the story of a person and their situation um, through family members, through archival media. Um, so I think Emily wants me to tell you about the impact of this film. Um, it was, I, I think I mentioned it was sent to the, the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles. It was part of the Texas Defender Service's media campaign that they launched right before the Supreme Court made its decision to grant cert. Um, it was quoted in uh, national newspaper articles across the country. They just directly stole from it without <laughs> without attribution, which, as Emily says, is 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 what the goal is. You don't, you know, you you want um, to in, in certain cases to hand the media these stories, to hand them these voices, and to have them bring these voices further to a national audience. Um, it was uh, pieces of the interviews with the jurors were um, were played on. Um, uh, BET, Nightly News, and on NPR, um, and subsequently the the Supreme Court granted cert in this case. Um, you know, I, I can't I can't tie I can't say give cause and effect here, um, but we all know that that uh, that public perceptions of things, uh, you know, ha has an impact. And I, I don't know I don't know how how or if. The Supreme Court justices were aware of this film, but this film certainly made the general public aware of the issue and aware of Thomas Miller L. Um, the the outcome of in the Supreme Court was that uh, twice the the Supreme Court um, sent the case back to the Fifth Circuit. Is it the Fifth Circuit in Texas? And uh, and and you know asked them to to reconsider it and that. With, with kind of st stern instructions that that you know that that Thomas Miller um, had had his you know that that Batson had been violated in the cases without without uh, taking the action themselves uh, to give him a new trial and I think twice was it twice the the Fifth Circuit ignored them and I think in one case um, the they actually cited from Clarence Jones' minority opinion as the basis for for, for you know uh, not following with the, the mandate the Supreme Court had given them. Yeah, sorry, what did I say? Oh, sorry, <laughs> Clarence Thomas. Um, and what what's happened in the more, more recent future, more recent present, is that uh, Thomas Millerell has been given a new trial, and. He is off death row and in Dallas County Jail, awaiting that trial. Um, it's an interesting issue because it's kind of the juror's issue. It's not really his issue. He's kind of uh, has like this. He's a, a third party who gets to raise it because he's, he's the person who has standing in the court to raise the issue. But the 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 denial, the violation of rights, is really to the jurors who weren't permitted to serve on his jury. Um, and making this film was a real challenge. It was. Very bizarre to from, from taking the phone call from Jim Marcus to landing in, in Dallas, Texas, and hunting down these these people who had served as jurors, you know, almost 20 years before, and you know, 
you know, it, it's kind of like, we, we just didn't think anyone would have anything compelling to say about it. It's, it's a non-event, really, if they even remembered it. If, do you remember 20 years ago when you weren't picked to serve on a jury, and how did that make you feel? You know, most people are going to be pretty happy about that, if they remember it at all. Um, but what this situation had that was slightly different was the, the, the manual that the Dallas County DA's office you know, put in print, and that, that horrible internal memo that you saw. So it was, it was a real lesson for us, kind of going around, knocking on doors, finding these people, and showing them those documents, and seeing how it actually did harm them, and how it had an effect on them, and how they really cared, and felt violated. And um, I think showing that violation, and, and showing that it is actually a real harm, and that people were actually offended, um, had a tremendous impact. Um, you know, as far as pre-production of this video, we really literally, I mean, the, the Texas Defender Service did the best they could, but essentially they just gave, threw us down there with like a, a sheet of names and phone numbers, and we literally went door to door looking for these people. Um, it's kind of surprising to us in retrospect that, that it was, that we were successful in finding them as we were. Um, I wouldn't advocate uh, if, if you're going to go out there and make videos, I would advocate better pre-production than that. Um, this is kind of hit or miss. I think that, that you, should find your, you should find your subjects in advance. You should pre-interview them. You should make sure they want to participate in this, because this could have been a total disaster. Um, we were, I mean, we were, we were just really lucky. In addition to getting these jurors willing to talk to us in camera, we actually got several, I think three former district attorneys from the Dallas County District Attorney's Office to talk to us on camera. And one of them uh, was actually present in the room um, at, at a training session where these rules were introduced. And he got to tell us about, about hearing that and, and the effect it had on the office. Um, you know, why they agreed to do it, I, I don't know. <laughs> but it was, it, it's pretty damning to, to have them coming forward and, and talking about it. And as, as soon as the, the Supreme Court agreed to hear Thomas's case, there was a lot of other people um, from who had been tried in Dallas County during the same period um, because that they, you know all this investigation went on and the manual was discovered. Um, there were a lot of other people who had similar Batson claims um, that also received relief. Um, so the yeah. Um, the, the next film we're, actually, we're going to discuss is actually the, our most recent project. We finished it um, in April. Um, we shot it early this year. Um, another project that we worked on with the, with the Texas Defender Service, but this time their office in Austin. Um, and it's a film about um, a man on death row named Scott Panetti, um, who is schizophrenic, um, was on death row for 13 years, I believe. Um, and he also had a Supreme Court hearing, and it was over the issue of whether, um, of whether it's cruel and unusual to execute someone who doesn't understand the reasons they're being put to death. Um, so we were very excited to work on this uh, piece because we thought that the Supreme Court decision potentially could, you know, could limit the scope and the reach of the death penalty further in a way that they've been sort of chipping away at it for years. Um, so we were hoping that they would come down with a decision that would not only um, give Scott Panetti relief, but would also um, declare it unconstitutional to, um, to execute um, mentally ill people. Um, so we made this video we, in, I guess in two months, under two months, I guess in like six weeks, you know, he had a Supreme Court hearing, so the turnaround had to be really fast. It had to be out a week before his hearing, so it could it could generate, um, it can be used to generate media attention. Um, the, the video cost about $20,000 to make, and the way the Texas Defender Service fundraised for it is they, they had, a, they submitted a grant proposal for the media outreach, for the public outreach around their cert petition. And we, we came in early enough that we were able to be a part of their grant proposal. Um, you know, we submitted sections of the, we participated in the writing of the proposal and submitted sections on our work and a budget for how much our contribution would cost. 
There are more grants available these days for media outreach campaigns um, for in the, in the legal realm. So that's that's helpful in the work that we do. Um, it ended up, uh, it was sent out to, to hundreds of news outlets. It was The story was picked up by about 25 outlets, including um, NPR, Associated Press, Christian Science Monitor, ABC News. Um, a lot more had, had given their word to cover the story, but there's a lot you can't control. Um, and one of those things is what other what else happens the day that you release your story, um, and the day that we released this story was the day that the Virginia Virginia Tech shootings happened. Um, so it got bumped from from a lot, but it still it still made an impact. It definitely made an impact locally in Texas. It was covered very well in, in all the Texas newspapers and Texas um, television stations. So I'll, I'll show a clip of that. And the the media campaign around Scott Panetti's case was coordinated by the. The Justice Project out of DC, which um, organizes a lot of campaigns around death penalty cases. In Kerrville, Texas, on September 21st, 1995, Scott Panetti was convicted of murdering his in-laws, Joe and Amanda Alvarado, and was sentenced to death. Prior to the crime, Scott Panetti had a 10-year history of mental illness, including more than a dozen stays in psychiatric institutions. Scott is schizophrenic and was unmedicated at the time of the crimes. I'm Yvonne Panetti. I'm the mother of Scott Panetti. Scott, as a child, was terrific. He was sweet and easy to deal with. He just was a lovely child. He had his bigger brother he always followed around, you know, and between the two of them, they kept, kept his mother and I pretty active. And when the boys were small, they would go with me on a lot of jobs where I could take them, you know. And they were always real active and good helpers. Bought a small kind of a hobby farm, I guess you'd call it, just to get the kids away from the city and give them a country life like I had. I was four years old, and he would always, you know, goof around with me and play with me. And he was a good brother, but, you know, that was before he started showing signs of sickness or schizophrenia. But I can remember going downstairs. He was laying on the bed, and he had his hands like this. And he's look, just looking, just staring in space. And uh, I went in there, and I said, Scott, you acted like you're listening to something. Did you have your music on? He said, it's just the music in my head. He seemed to be drawing away from us. And I thought, well, maybe it just, he'll grow out of this. It's his teenage silliness, you know. And he just, just completely, personality was, was, you could see it was changing. Some, some days he'd be great. Half the time he didn't seem like the same kid, you know. I was 18 or 19 when he would call the radio station in Fredericksburg, Texas, and uh, I, ha I hadn't seen him in a long time. And he kept calling and saying, this is Sarge. Why won't you play my song? You know, uh, this is Sergeant Ranahan Iron Horse here, and he kept calling over and over until they played his song. And I, that's when I really realized that he was really getting sick because that he really thought that he was another person. 
In 1986, Scott developed the delusion that the devil was out to get him. He buried his valuables in the dirt and washed his walls and furniture to exorcise the devil from his home. So it got so bad with several incidents that we ended up, we had him committed. We had him arrested one time, just picked up. And from then on, it just kept getting worse. He was allowed to come home. And he was, he was helping his dad, but he was just like a zombie when he'd help Jack milk or whatever. He just would go through the motions. Had him evaluated, different doctors, different psychiatrists, and they all come up pretty much with the same thing, basically a schizophrenia. And uh, after we found this out, you know, we could kind of put things together. It's been coming on for quite some time. And uh, that's about it. Uh, next thing I know, I'm on the job. And the foreman stopped me, the boss, the superintendent. Jack, he said, you got a phone call. You got to call home right away. And that's when Scott was held up after he shot the Alvarados. I went back to the job and I told mother, I said, you want me to come home? She says, no, there ain't no sense of coming home right now. So I went back just to get it off my mind. We got back on the machine and I kept it going. <laughs> that's pretty much what I've been doing ever since. It's something that's very important to us in the, in the advocacy videos that we make is uh, not only humanizing um, the, the, the person in prison, but also showing the effect um, of on his on the person's family, um, the 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 family of the prisoners is, is is often hugely ignored and not considered um, in this process. While the family of the victim is you know is put in front of every television camera that comes around. Um, so I, you know you just saw the beginning when we were just sort of establishing the history of his mental illness. There was a lot of different components of this of this film um, showing the history of his mental illness. He had a huge you know a a very well, luckily, a very well documented history um, that I think was very useful to his lawyers. Um, so the the Supreme Court um, uh, gave the ruling on June 27th, um, and they decided to spare Scott's life. So he's now um, his sentence has been um, commuted to life in prison without the possibility of parole, um, which is really the best anyone. We could hope for in this case. I mean, now they're going to they're going to continue to fight to try to get him to to be moved to to a, I'm sure a medical facility. Um, but the Supreme Court, what they didn't do is they didn't rule on the larger issue um, of of executing mentally ill people. Instead, they they based their decision on um, uh, uh, the fact that he didn't have an adequate hearing um, for some of the issues that 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 his lawyers were raising. Um, but it's great. It's great. It's great for, for Scott and his family. We were just hoping that, that it would also be great for other people who were in, similar, in a similar situation. Um, Sarah was talking earlier about the value of, of having um, the, the, the prisoner in the film or not having the prisoner in the film. And in this case, um, we were denied access to interview Scott. Um, but I think it was better that way because um, he would have had to display his mental illness in a way that was very compelling. Um, and he, you know, he's, had, he's, not, he's not medicated. He hasn't been medicated since he's been in prison. Um, he does come across as um, you know, exhibiting severe signs of his mental illness, but he does have, have days where he's more lucid than others. Um, so you never know what day, what day we would have met him. Um, we were lucky enough that their, their HBO made a documentary about Texas death row, and there was a clip of him in that documentary, which we ended up using. Because our films aren't um, meant for broadcast, um, we can use any footage we want from anyone and never have to deal with licensing issues, um, which is, although there may be some, li we do stream what? them online. So, so there could be, uh, which, which, which what Emily means is that if, if you're not going to broadcast something um, and you're just using it 
you're you know you're, you're distributing it behind the scenes that licensing issues don't come up as much not that they not that's true no, it, it, not that it's entirely legal <laughs> what you meant to say is we don't deal with the licensing yeah. issues we don't deal with licensing that's issues um, although although all of our music um, that all the music that we use is produced for our films so we're not we're not taking music and anytime we have given this film when when uh, when broadcasters are interested in showing segments, and you know, as part of their news, we, we remove the footage that we know shouldn't be broadcast. Um, so that's another reason why it hasn't come up as an issue because we're very we're careful about it. Um, but you know, but for the purpose of public education, you know, um, I think we probably I, I can't I don't know what claim anyone would have in coming out. Emily's arguing fair use. Fair use. <laughs> um, so, so we didn't end up getting him this film, and I think I think it's better that way. And I also think that his family is suffering in his absence. You know, the fact that he has been away from them for 13 years um, is is a lot more um, profound when he's not present in the film. And again, this is this like the Thomas film is a hybrid film that raises a legal issue about you know what a person needs to be able to comprehend or understand in order to be executed for a crime, and um, you know. Kind of mitigating reasons why uh, that person shouldn't be executed at all because they're they're a, a person um, who has uh, who's a product of a particular set of circumstances and and a, you know and, and a particular chemical imbalance and, and you know why they why Scott is who he is. It also goes goes through um, several points in his trial. And Scott actually was was allowed to was considered competent to defend himself at trial. Um, so there was a lot of things that happened in this trial um, which would shock anyone. So we went through, um, including him, he subpoenaed Jesus Christ and Anne Bancroft and, uh, and a whole host of other people um, to come testify at his trial. Um, he represented himself wearing a, a, a kind of a cowboy uniform in court and, you know, questioned people. He mainly was interested in questioning ex-girlfriends about their sexual history. Yeah. Um, it was, it's really shocking. Uh, you know, the, all of these films, the full-length film is available on our website if, if you want to um, watch the rest of them. And how long is this one? The length of the whole film? I, I think it's like 23 minutes. Um, we try to make films as, as short as they can be, getting all of the information across. Um, there's a lot of information to get across in this one, which is the only reason <coughs> that it's as long as it is. How much more time do we have? Because I don't know if we have time to show another song. Or... Yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think everybody's really enjoying it. So. Oh, OK. <laughs> okay. Um, do you so, want to talk about? Yeah. Uh, the, the last film that, that we want to show you um, is uh, a wrongful conviction film. Uh, and it's a, it's a clemency film. It was, uh, we produced it in the fall of 2005. And I think it took about, the production took around three to four months total. It was a little, it was the most complicated film that Emily and I have made for a variety of reasons and Emily said to me over lunch that she would never do it again. <laughs> um, but the, the reason why this film was complicated uh, was because it was made for three different defendants and we were working with um, three different legal teams. The The funding for this one is it was pretty easy because um, these men were represented by pro bono teams at different corporate law firms. So money was not an obstacle for them in, in producing this film. And I don't, I, there's plenty of people that, that don't have the great fortune to have this kind of power um, in terms of cash behind them. But uh, the, the Norfolk Four um, were four men who uh, confessed, who falsely confessed to a rape and murder they didn't commit. The film was made for three of them, but it's about all four of them. And the, an, another big challenge here was, was showing how uh, four different people could, could falsely confess to a crime. Um, I think it's, you know, it's easier if it was just one person and then you could show the peculiar set of circumstances that put pressure on that one person. But the, the more people you add to it, the, the less and less like, the less and less believable it is. So we had the challenge of explaining the phenomena of false confession and explaining how it was possible in these cases and balancing the, 
the you know the, the different needs and concerns of, of three different legal teams who each wanted their um, their client to appear in a certain way and didn't want it compromised you know by the representation of the of the other defendant's story. So I guess we'll show it and then we can talk about it. And just you know about um, communication between um, between filmmakers and lawyers. Um, this was particularly challenging, probably because we were working with with, um, with three different legal teams. But you'll see, you know, and something that's important to them in this film, and you'll and you'll see in, in the opening sequence that we show, is that the story be presented in the first five minutes. That it, it be laid out in the first, you know, in the opening of the film, so that should I and mean, we're sending it to the governor of Virginia. Should the governor turn it off, um, at least he'll get he'll get a sense of of where the film is going. Um, and what and what claims are being raised by the defendants? Um, so and and we thought about it. I mean, we you know for for weeks, so we ended up getting it as short as we could possibly get it, and, and still having everyone be happy. But you'll see that you know that you know our you have to compromise um, artistically, you know, often in order to 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 make a product that that is the most effective and that everyone's happy with. So I think that was one of the. I, and now Emily's made me think of something else I would say. That about the, the morning panel is that, that, uh, that many, many of you were asking questions of lawyers about filmmaking. And, and, and it's not that those lawyers didn't have a role in it. I, I'm sure they had a big role in it, but you weren't. I was wondering about the filmmakers and, and what they would say about the storytelling. Because I do think, I mean, there is a tension between, uh, between filmmakers and lawyers in, in how to tell these stories. And, you know, that... Uh, it's an interesting tension. It's a challenging tension. It's something you you need to figure out a way to 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 get all the legal information in there and a way to tell a story that's um, that's compelling. Um, you know, I, somehow or other, you work it out. It doesn't end up being you know the. I mean, it doesn't end up being the story that you would make as a filmmaker if you weren't making a film for lawyers. And I think. For the filmmakers in, in the room, that's an important thing to understand is that that you are making a film for a particular audience and for a particular purpose. And you know that it's definitely one of the things that it's that took Emily and I a long time to understand. Even in wrestling with the making of this particular film, um, one of the things we fought really hard for early on was there is um, there is somebody who ultimately confessed to this crime who. Um, is the real perpetrator and whose whose DNA matched the scene, and there's a lot of reasons which you won't see now why this is was 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 clearly a single perpetrator crime. And Emily and I wanted to leave that reveal till later in the film because we thought you know we'd go through all of this and then then you know it'd be this expose and you know and here's the real here's the real killer. Um, but it was important to the legal team that we have his picture, you know, and, and his information up at the very front of the film because and. Rightly so, that you know, uh, uh, someone watching this film uh, in a legal context could turn it off after a couple minutes, and they would never get there. But uh, but from our perspective, that was you know, poor storytelling. And, and then there were some, you know, there were some battles that we won. Like for instance, the lawyers didn't want any any imagery of any like mugshots of their clients. They didn't want them to be seen as criminals. They don't consider them criminals. They're innocent people in prison, so they didn't want any mugshots. But you know, in terms of like storytelling, you really need everything at your disposal. So we made the compromise to only use mugshots when referring to like you know to the state's case, you know, and then we, they would always be, be humanized when we would be talking about their story. So. In the 1990s, Daniel Williams, Joseph Dick Jr., Derek Tice, and Eric Wilson joined the Navy with aspirations of serving their country. Today, three of the four remain in prison, serving life sentences for falsely confessing to a rape and murder that none of them committed, despite the fact that DNA has identified the real killer. Billy Bosco and Michelle Moore Bosco were high school sweethearts and newlyweds living in Norfolk, Virginia, where Billy, a Navy seaman, was stationed. On July 8, 1997, Billy returned from a Navy cruise to find his 18-year-old wife, Michelle, brutally murdered on the bedroom floor of the apartment they shared. Billy ran across the hall to the apartment of Daniel and Nicole Williams, 
Daniel Williams called 911 and accompanied Billy back to his apartment where he helped cover Michelle's body with a blanket. At the time, Daniel's wife Nicole had just returned from the hospital where she had undergone surgery for ovarian cancer and Daniel's parents were visiting from rural Michigan. Daniel and Nicole had been married for one week and his parents were planning to take them out for a celebratory dinner. Then before we could go out to dinner, the guy next door came and knocked on the door. Daniel opened the door and found the neighbor had just hollered that his wife was dead. A couple of plainclothes detectives entered the apartment and were questioning Daniel and Nicole about their uh, relationship with the neighbors. And then at one point they asked if Daniel would be willing to go to the police station and answer some more questions to be as helpful as he could. The officers said that if he drove his own truck over there, he would be free to leave after a little bit and uh, meet us for dinner. The investigation was headed by Detective Robert Glenn Ford, and the police immediately focused their suspicion on Daniel because they had been informed that he may have had a crush on Michelle. We went back home. We sat up most of the night waiting for Daniel to call us, but he never called us, so we fell asleep. And the next morning, we got up around 10. They called and said he was had signed a paper that he was guilty. Daniel maintained his innocence for hours, explaining that he had spent the day of the crime with his wife and family, and that he and his wife were in bed at the time the police said that Michelle was killed. Daniel's wife told the police the same story. The detectives falsely told Daniel that they had an eyewitness who saw him leaving Michelle's apartment on the night of the murder. Daniel volunteered to take a lie detector test and passed it, but the police lied to him and told him he failed. Detectives interrogated Daniel all night. After more than nine hours, Daniel confessed, stating that he had raped and murdered Michelle by beating her to death with his fist and a shoe. When the autopsy report revealed that Michelle had been stabbed and strangled, a detective returned to Daniel and had him sign a second confession that reflected this new information. It seemed like a bad dream and then all of a sudden we woke up and it wasn't a dream. It's very real. They went on to arrest eight other uh, Navy men. Um, when, when Daniel's DNA didn't match, they brought in someone else whose DNA didn't match, they brought in someone else whose DNA didn't match, they ended up having eight people arrested, none of whose DNA matched the, the crime scene evidence. Um, and, and none of their stories matched. They all gave drastically different accounts of the murder. Um, and when, when the real killer confessed to the crime and said that he did it alone and said that the four other people in jail are stupid um, for confessing, they, um, they didn't, they changed, they kept changing their story, they kept changing their theory of, theory of the crime, and then it became a gang rape. And then this man that they never knew, they said they, that all five of them had raped and murdered her together. Um, and the, the real killer, who is an African-American gentleman uh, with a confession, and, you know, with a, a, a white victim, African-American, um, uh, man accused with a confession and a DNA match in a death penalty state um, it was looking pretty bad for him so they gave him a sheet of paper that said if you say that these four other people were with you we'll give you life in prison so you know he signed the paper uh, to save his own life um, he's, he's since recanted um, but currently all those three men are still in prison um, in Virginia and the, the procedural posture of their case is that uh, Two of them, I think, have, have exhausted all of their appeals. Um, and the, 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 there's one of them who, is, is it Derek Tice? Which one is it? Derek Tice um, has, was recently given a new trial um, on, you know, on the basis of uh, a lot of the, uh, the work that, the, that these law firms and hopefully these videos had a part in, in swaying public opinion. Um, I, I wanted to, 
this watching this and seeing how wordy it is, I'm like, oh, it's so wordy, you know. And and I don't necessarily know that uh, that um, you know. I mean, even looking at it again, I, I I say, you know, to to serve this purpose, we could have told it with less words. And um, and I, I guess that's a battle that that we're going to continually be fighting. It's interesting counterpoint to this morning when we were talking about how. You know, they need very few words to tell a day in the life video, and, and how words are superfluous. And um, you know, and and you know, I, I I identify with that very strongly. At the same time, I understand that that these are different types of, of videos serving a different purpose. Um, they're not being used in the courtroom, and you know, they they look more like real documentaries. Um, so. Um, there's there's different concerns um, in 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 putting it together and, and what you want to produce what the final product is. Um, this video was produced about two years ago. Um, this I think in August it finally uh, was in the New York Times magazine. There was a, a story about the case, so it's still kind of they're still trying to get justice for these men. So I know everybody's going to have a lot of questions for you. So.